Tonight, what I want to do is get into some of the principles, and I want to go over six verses. Me and Jonathan were just about there talking. This book is so full of wisdom and knowledge and things of God and spiritual things that it is so hard to, I mean, we can spend a long time on the, on the letters of the Thessalonians. And to show you that, we're only going to cover six verses on the first chapter. Six verses. And you'll see how chock full of great things from God there is in this, in this letter. Some things I want to consider before we get started actually reading the Thessalonians. We went over some background. We went over some places and some things that were going on. But a couple things I want to point out before we actually start reading, because they're important not only to us, but they were important to Paul, and they're important to every Christian that reads the Bible and walks and is trying to walk the way God wants us to walk. The first thing is, and I wrote a note down here, I'm going to read it first. Think about these principles as you read the letters. So as you're reading, I want you to think about what's going on. We're going to look at some characters and their perspectives and things like that, but I want you to really think about what's being written and who's reading and what's going on in that time, all right? But first principle that applies to us, it applies to Paul, Timothy, Silas, and the Thessalonians, and everybody, every Christian that ever lived, and every godly person that's in the Bible is the fear of God, all right? The fear of God, if you, if you know Proverbs 9-10, it's a famous verse. Who can, who can quote it? Yes? Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but knowledge and holy is understanding. Knowledge of the holy, yes. Knowledge of the holy, holy, right? So the beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of God. Let me ask you a question. Without the fear of God, is there any wisdom? Okay. I want you to think about I'll run up here an, an analogy of the alphabet. When you're a child and you're in school, the beginning of a grammar education is what? The alphabet. A, B, C, D, E. And once you get that, once you've got that down, then what do you start doing? You start putting things together, two letters, then three letters, then four, then five, and then it just keeps on building. You're, now you're doing sentences. Now you're doing paragraphs. What if you forget the alphabet? You're in trouble. You're done. Education has been lost. You have to start all over, right? It's the same way the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. You cannot get wisdom or understanding in the word of God, of spiritual things of God, without fear of God. That's the beginning of education and spiritual things. Right. We see. Seeking for God. Who knows who Zach Poonin is? Anybody ever heard of him? He's an old Indian pastor who, I mean, if you get a chance to listen to him, he's very, he's a Christian, but he's very, very good. He's very rich in spiritual truth, and he, he breaks things down really good. But he came up with this verse. I've never heard, I've never heard this verse before. If you want to turn there, you can. Jeremiah 29, 13. Now, these are some preliminaries before we get into. I just want you to know that this is, these are building blocks to get into this letter. All right? 29, Jeremiah 29, 13. And you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Now, what happens if you don't search him with all of your heart? Can you find him? You'll just be worldly. That's pretty interesting, right? Yeah. If you look at it from that perspective, if he says, the way you find me when you're seeking me is to seek me with all of your heart. That's right. And so when we really think about it as Christians, a lot of us are slacking. A lot of us are slacking, right? And we're not using our full heart to chase after God and to seek after God. And this is why we are biblically illiterate. 
This is why we can't tell, we can't no longer quote John 3.16, you know, things like this. You see, our spiritual knowledge starts here. We don't fear God anymore. And then it starts here. We don't seek God with all of our heart, you see. And we're going to see a difference in the Thessalonians that they do do this. Yes. Well, it's interesting to me with that verse there. Satan believes this, so he can get us not to serve, to seek God with all our hearts. He knows he's going to win. It's definitely something he knows, absolutely. I mean, I mean he knows for 6,000 six years, he knows what it means. Mean, so he'll absolutely. take advantage of this, he's just his advantage. I'm going to, you know, I think one of the, the best ways to describe something is what? Through experience, right? So if we experience something, then we can tell other people about it. This just happened last night. That's how close a proximity it was. Me and my family cut the TV off, no cell phones, no computers, no nothing, and we just sat there. My baby in this hand, my little girl in this hand, and we just sat there and listened to each other talk and listened to each other. You want to talk about beautiful. You want to talk about, I was like, wow, where did, where, where, where's this been? You know, where has this been? I constantly hear noise on the television or I constantly hear something on, you know, the yeah. phone. Yeah. But when it's silent and I can just hear my kids talking to Goo and to God, you know, and my wife asked me a question. We're just sitting there in silence and it's just us. Man, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Right? It's a beautiful thing. And so I think one of the issues is not using all of our heart is that our heart is in different places all the time. Yeah. He's made it so busy for us. Yeah. He's made it, we, we're, we're being stretched this way and stretched that way, you know. And I want to say that uh, if you guys have seen what's happened in Charlottesville this weekend, right? There was a girl that died. There was some things going on. I mean, America is getting, it's getting separated right down the middle. Oh, yeah. You see? And Christians are being pulled in to this because we're taking sides. And I had a conversation with my dad about it. And I said, what? What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? What is the Christian response to this? And it all has to go, it all has to do with we need to be Christ-centered and we need to we need to seek God with all of our heart and ask him what we do. What is our response? You see. So uh, Hosea 10:3. Use a little bit of scripture tonight. Hosea 10:3. Still on seeking God. Or 10:12, sorry. Hosea 10, 12. This is for Christians now. This is for Christians. And this was in the Old Testament. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord. Till he come and rain righteousness upon you. It's time. It's time that we seek God, but we can't do it without seeking him with all of our heart. And that part right there where it says fallow ground, who knows what fallow ground is? Where it's really hard. What is where it? It's really hard. Uh, no, not quite. Not quite. Anybody? Fallow ground is tilled ground that hasn't been sowed yet. Oh, okay. You see? We need to be sowing the word of God into the fallow ground, right? That's what he's talking about right there. It's time to seek God. And one more, Luke 12. Luke 12. Start with verse 28. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what you shall eat or what you shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you have need of these things. We don't seek God because we're seeking other stuff. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to do? Where are we going on vacation? Well, you see, that's what we're doing. And so, very important principle, when we get into this letter about seeking God, you're going to see that the Thessalonians, they sought after God. 
like we are not doing today. Humility. Who knows who Mephibosheth is? <laughs> That's a name that you don't really hear all the time. Yes? He was David's, no, Saul's son that David brought to his uh, kingdom to take care of him, and he was a crippled boy. Very close. He was Jonathan's son. Oh, yeah, Jonathan. Saul's, his grandfather. Yeah. Anyway. But what's the significance of humility in this? Anybody know? In that story. The significance is this. He's a lame man that got hurt in battle. All right? And David says, because he loved Saul and he loved Jonathan, right? Like his own. He, he, and he said, bring anybody who's of the sons of Saul, bring them here to me. And when he gets there, he sees that he's lame and crippled. And I want to read a verse for you. This verse is awesome. If you want to turn there, you can. Second Samuel. If, if you were here when I, we were going over Greek words, some of you weren't, but we were breaking down Greek words and we broke down the word worship, right? The word worship basically means that uh, in the Bible, it means like a dog licking the hand. That's what it means, worship. And I want you to look at Mephibosheth and what he says in verse 8. When David, in verse 7, David said, Fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake. And will restore you all the land of Saul, your father. And you shall eat bread at my table continually. This is what Mephibosheth does. He bows himself and says, What is thy servant that you shouldest look upon <coughs> such a dead dog and lion? Humility. You see that? This is the way we should be before God. Okay. Is it Nine eight. That's a that's an L right there. Yeah. <laughs> Nine eight. Sorry. Sorry. Whoa. Uh oh, everybody's like, oh, I don't know. Yeah, I was like right out to lunch. So Mephibosheth says, Why is thy servant? What is thy servant that thou shalt look upon such a dead dog as I am? You know, the Lord Jesus Christ is our king. Is he not? He's our king. And so the humility that we and you're going to see Paul shows in these letters is exactly our, what our humility should be as well to the king, which is, what, what am I? What is your servant that you would even look upon me, Lord? You see, that was, that's the message of humility. We'll see that in Paul here in just a second. Now, this is a big one. And we're going to see this all throughout these letters. The living Testimony. Tell me what the difference is between a spoken testimony and a living testimony. Anybody? Anybody? Um. Isn't the living testimony how you live your life as a Christian so that people, even though they don't go to church, they know that you are the church because of the way you live your life? Yes, absolutely. That's exactly what it is. So... As we go through these letters, courageous and firm were the Thessalonians. We're going to see that. The question is, and I put, I didn't put it right here, but I've got all these places right here to say, ask yourself, ask yourself. The reason I put these things here is ask yourself, ask yourself if you have a living testimony for Jesus Christ. Not just a spoken testimony, not just I'm a Christian and then you don't live it, right? A living testimony. One thing that the Thessalonians were, were courageous. We're not going to get into it, but it tells about their affliction, right? They received the word with affliction. They were being persecuted because of it, but they were courageous and they stood firm. You see, the question is, is will you... Stand firm and be courageous. Because Revelation 21.8, you don't have to turn there unless you want to. But Revelation 21.8 says something really interesting. It says in verse 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God and he shall be my son. And then he says, but the fearful and unbelieving, those are the first two things 
before the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, before all those people, the fearful and the unbelieving will be cast into the lake of fire. It's interesting that they put the fearful and the unbelieving before a liar and before a murderer. You see? So, the fearful, it means timid. And if you look this up in a lexicon, it's talking about Christians. It's talking about so-called Christians who will not stand up for Jesus Christ. And because they don't, they apostatize. They go away from the faith. Once they are, uh, the Lord Jesus talks about it in John 15, where he says, these seeds are getting sown, right? And all, when these seeds are getting sown in the word, then they're persecuted. The word goes away. They automatically fall away because, yes? Let's go back to the first thing we just talked about. Fear of God because they have a fear of man. And they have a fear of God. The fear of God is the fear of wisdom, which you serve for God alone. When you have a fear of man, no longer are you seeking after the God. You're just you're trying to, you're, you're worrying more about what people think or whatever. Right. And then you move that direction. How many people, this is a hypothetical question. But how many Christians do you actually think fear man? When it comes down to it, when it really comes down to it, Paul was prisoned and beaten and shipwrecked and all these things, right? How many Christians today, including yourselves, would go through all that and still have a living testimony, right? And still say, it doesn't matter. I know whom I have believed. See, and I am confident in him. doesn't matter what I go through. How many people can actually say that, can actually have that living testimony and not be timid when it comes down to time? But how do you do that? By the word of God. You hide the word of God in your heart. And so when these times come along, God speaks to you and you're able to live out these things. So the other one, unbelieving, is rejectors of the true faith. These are the next people. The timid and uncourageous and the unbelieving are the first ones that are going to get tossed into the lake of fire. That's incredible to me. Because you would look at it and go, he's a liar, he's a whoremonger, he's a this, he's a murderer. But God looks at the heart, does he not? Yes, he does. Right? Yeah. David, and everybody talks about David and they try to justify their own sin because of what David did and his adultery and his murder and all this stuff. Right? But... David had a heart for God, mm -hmm. but his fleshly sin got a hold of him, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's why those two things are on top, because those are heart issues. Yeah. See? Right. So, fear of God, seeking after God, humility and a living testimony are the backbone of a Christian. You see, backbone of a Christian. And we'll see that in these letters. Let's go ahead and turn to 1 Thessalonians. So a few characters in these letters I want to talk about first. And what I want you to do as we're going through these verses and as we are talking about these letters and talking about the people in these letters, what I want you to do is, and as you're reading, because I want you to read these letters as we're studying them on your own, I want you to look at things from these people's perspective. I said, I don't know how long ago it was, but the Bible is full of episodes, right? It's full of like little movies, boom. Boom, boom, you see? And if you really look at it, if me and Marcia and Bill and Maria were to go to the beach, right? And we walked out onto the beach and we all walked in a line and we walked out there and we stood and we stood out there for 20 minutes just observing everything. We were told to write something down about our experience. 
do you think that my experience would be the same as Bill's? Or Marcia's the same as Maria's? You would see something different then, right? If you do not read the Bible like that, you're not going to get it all. So you have to look at things from, and I know it's, you can't be Paul, and you can't look at everything from what he was going through, but just know that when he was in Corinth, where he came from, he came from getting beat and in prison and getting kicked out of town and all these different things happened to him while he's writing these letters. He's got these things in his mind of what these people were going through while he was there. Timothy and Silas, they bring back a report about their journey up there, going to get a report and, and saying, look, hey, Paul's worried about you guys. We're just trying to figure out how everything's going and they're staying with, you see, there's just all these kind of different things going on. The Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost are all mentioned uh, in the letter. And so from the perspective of heaven, what's, what's kind of God looking at, you see, in the landscape and all that stuff, you see? And then the Thessalonians, Paul, is, Paul gets kicked out and Timothy are gone and everything's going awry and they got to hide and they're getting persecuted. And then next thing you know, Timothy and Silas walk into town, you see? And they're like, oh my goodness. And they go and they bring them in and they start telling them everything. And Timothy and Silas start seeing all the things that are going on. You see, different perspectives, different angles you have to come in. And I just put the people up here. I didn't put the situations and all that stuff, which are uh, another part of Bible study. But just think about the people. Look over Paul's shoulder while he's writing this. Ponder. I think that's what we don't do as Christians today. Because we do have so much noise. We have so many things going on. I want to I wanna watch a video of how, what, the, what this preacher says about this. Instead of going here saying, Lord, show me this. And reading this and just sitting there and meditating on it. Right? Joshua says, meditate on the word of the Lord day and night. But we don't meditate. I have a feeling we don't meditate. We we may read it, we go through it and go, okay, I've done my Bible study for today, and then I'm, I'm going to go on and do something else. So, we need to take out time to sit down and read, pray about it, and ponder on it, and think about it. All the different things that are going on. When I was um, in Iraq, the first, it was 2003, 2004, we didn't have TVs or cell phones or nothing like that. I would just lay in my rack, and it would be dark, and I would just think. And I told my family to send me those Left Behind series books. Y'all ever, ever seen them? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I got sent like four of them. And let me tell you, there's no, again, this goes back to what we were talking about with me and my wife sitting there. You are so much more keen to things when there's no noise. Yeah. When I'm reading these books, I'm sitting there. I can remember them visually as I was sitting there reading it. I mean, things are, I can see what's happening as I'm reading the book. And I'm like, oh, man, this is, and it, it was a page turning, you know, because there's no outside anything. I was just imagining. God's given us imagination, right? Yeah. So as we read, imagine what's going on, and it opens things up to you. So let's get into this. We start off. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus. Who is Silvanus? Is that Silas? Silas. Who is Timotheus? Timothy. Timothy. I want to stop right there. This is the this is what is considered the salutation of the letter. All right, the basically the letterhead. What's interesting about this is that Paul is the apostle of the apostles. Right? I mean, he is it. He is chosen of God. To go to the Gentiles and spread the gospel. But what does he do? He doesn't say, I, Pope Paul, or Bishop Paul writing to you from. You see, like puts his name all big and bold up there and says, I, I am the leader of the church and I this. He doesn't do that, right? He says, me and Silas and Timothy. He starts adding everybody in there, right? Why does he do that? Because he's humble. His humility puts him in a position where even though he's the head of the apostles, even though he's up here, he comes down here and he's with his disciples. 
And they're together writing this letter. And then he says, unto the church of the Thessalonians. If you've read all the letters of the Apostle Paul, you'll notice that this is the only letter that he points out or gives credit to a certain people group. You can go and look at all of them. All the rest of them say to the church that's at Ephesus, to the church at Corinth, to the, to the saints in Philippi. You see that? But what does he say here? To the church of the Thessalonians. He points them out as a people. Who thinks they know why he does that? I'll give you my take on it. That's reading the letter. What is it? He says the man with the Lord died. Okay. That's a good way to say it. So as reading this letter, I think the reason that he says this, a lot of you got people out there that say, well, it was his first letter and this is the way he did it. Maybe. But if you look at what they were doing and as he's writing to them, they take ownership of the body of Christ. They take ownership of their group, right? They say, we are of God. We're going to stand for God. This is us. You see that? At Corinth, they weren't like that. It was a different people. Philippi was a different people. But the Thessalonians, as we'll see, were a very close, very dedicated group. And I think that's why he, he said to the church at of the Thessalonians because they took ownership of what they had and what was built there. Now, son, he's talking over there. <laughs> yep. So Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can anybody tell me what they think that to be in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Okay. Is it? Do you think it means like being in this church, like we walk in the church house, or we get in our car? Are we like that when it comes to the Lord Jesus? No, we got a personal relationship. Personal relationship. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Right. Let me read something. It's going to go along with what you say. Who's heard of R. W. Scott? John R. W. Scott. Let me read something for you. At an address given in 1983 at a leadership luncheon following the National Prayer Breakfast, Washington D.C., 1983. I want y'all to listen. How things have changed. 1983. All right. This is him. When we meet some people, we know immediately and instinctively that they are different. We are anxious to learn their secret. It is not the way they dress or talk or behave, although it influences these things. It is not that they have affixed a name tag to themselves or proclaim themselves to adherent of a particular religion or ideology. It's not even that they have a strict moral code which they faithfully follow. It is that they know Jesus Christ and that he is a living reality to them. They dwell in him and he dwells in them. He is the source of their life and it shows in everything they do. And then he reads a poem. Not merely in the words you say, not only in the deeds confessed, but in the most unconscious way. Is Christ expressed? It is a uh, beautiful smile. A holy light upon your brow. Oh no, I felt his presence when you laughed just now. To me, t'was not the truth you taught. To you so clear, to me still dim. But when you came, you brought a sense of him. And from your eyes, he beckons me. And from your heart, his love is shed. Till I lose sight of you and see Christ instead. Amazing. Wow. These people have an inner serenity which adversity cannot disturb. It is the peace of Christ. They have a spiritual power that physical weakness cannot destroy. It is the power of Christ. They have a hidden vitality that even the process of dying and death cannot quench. It is the life of Christ. To use biblical expressions, the peace of Christ rules in their hearts. 
The power of Christ is made perfect in their weakness, and the life of Christ is made manifest in their mortal flesh. The commonest description in the scriptures of a follower of Jesus is that he or she is a person in Christ. The expressions in Christ or in the Lord or in him occur 164 times in the letters of Paul alone and are indispensable to an understanding of the New Testament. To be in Christ does not mean to be inside Christ as tools are in a box or clothes in a closet, but to be organically united to Christ as a limb is in the body or a branch in the tree. It is this personal relationship with Christ that is the distinctive mark of his authentic followers. What does it mean to be in Christ, to have a personal relationship with him? Right? Yes. Um, I noticed that in uh, uh, 1 John verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, uh, says, And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. Hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. Outstanding. You know what I, I noticed, though? You take, I, I mean, I'm not picking on young people, but it's come to a point where uh, I'll say uh, 25, maybe and less. Even though they don't hear you use profanity and you speak of the Lord, they have no idea what you're even talking about. You take people a little bit older, at least they, they may not know Christ as their Savior, but they acknowledge the fact of where you're at. And, it, and the world's come so far down that, I mean, it, they're, they're not even recognizing there is a God right. and a Savior. Right. Any other thoughts on that? Right. So, back to the letter. So we see what it means to be in Christ, and he says that they are in Christ and in God the Father. <laughs> so... Then he ends with what he ends with, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He ends all his letters like, or ends the salutation with that. So verse 2. I want you all to think about this now. Think about this. Is this you? Can you, have you ever done this? Can you see yourself doing this? Is it what a Christian should do? He says, we give thanks to God always for you all. Making mention of you in our prayers. Scholars say that Paul wrote this weeks to months after he met these people. Weeks to months. This is not years. This is not 10 years, 15 years. Weeks to months. And this is what he says. We give thanks to God for all of you. How many people have you met in your walk with the Lord and you Knew them for a couple weeks, but then you prayed to God and said, Thank you, Lord, for letting me meet them. Anybody? I said, Thank you, Lord. For That's interesting, me. right? Yeah. Because yeah. it's few and far between, guaranteed, yeah. yes. I, ha I had a, a very dear friend that when I first met, I couldn't stand her because she talked too much. I mean, constantly. She looked by herself, she's an older lady. But as I got to know her, she taught me a lot of things about Christianity in itself. Even though she didn't go to church, she had a really strong belief in the Lord. And uh, so you just never know about who, you're, who God's going to put in your path. Right. And I, you know, again, as the, coming into Thessalonica was a path that he didn't want to take. We remember that. God told him not to go this way, but he's going to go this way. And so when he gets up there to Thessalonica, the, fact, the mere fact that after a couple weeks, Paul is saying, I thank God for meeting you. I mean, that's just interesting. And I mention you in my prayers all the time. And another interesting thing here is, again, he doesn't use the pronoun I. He says we, right? And we mention you in our prayers. He's putting himself, the apostle of the apostles, the pastor, the preacher, is not above his congregation. You see? He's in the mix with them. And he says we and us. We mention you and we thank God for you. Yes. Next verse. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith. Now, I didn't even I haven't even done this yet, but we were breaking down words. But I want to show you something interesting. 
The word faith is the word pistis. All right? It means belief, conviction, or the substance of things not seen. Right? The substance of things not seen. Paul says that. The word belief is pisteo, which comes from the word pistis. Faith and belief are the same word. Same word. The only difference is, this is the it. This is the thing. We are saved by grace through faith. The thing. Right? Whosoever believes is an action. You see that? So make sure when you're reading and you, you see faith and you see belief, know that it's the same thing. But belief is the action of faith, the thing. You see that? So their work of faith, their work of faith is their belief. Their belief. See? Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love. Now, I wrote some notes on this and I want to read it for you. It is clear that the Bible, that it's clear in the Bible that love is not a fleet of heart emotion like we know it to be today. Like when a 16 year old tells his girlfriend because he likes her, I love you so much. That's not love, right? That's what we call puppy love, right? So it's, it's not love at all. It's just he likes her and he thinks he loves her. Love is is completely and utterly sacrificial in the Bible. Is it not? So Jesus, uh, what does he say? That there's no greater love than what? A man than this. What is it? No greater love than a man had than this. To lay down his life for his friend. Lay down his life for his friend. Yes. He's going to give his life. Yes. Right? His existence. Well, not his existence, but his, his earthly life for somebody else is that sacrificial. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And so the greatest, the Lord Jesus says, the greatest form of love is to give your life for somebody else. Now, can a Christian do that without giving up their, the, the breath of life by dying? Can they give up their life in a, another way besides dying? Yes. The Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart be also. Okay. And honestly, your time and your money, it shows everything. It shows the man who loves it. Your time and your money shows exactly where you where what is most important. Right. Time, money, goods, mm -hmm. uh, counseling, teaching, whatever it is that I am sacrificing. Of myself for the glory of God, of course, but not for the glory, the glory of myself, but for the glory of God, sacrificing my life and giving it to somebody else and saying, I am here for you. Whatever you need, I want to give it to you. I want to make sure that you are taken care of. And this is their labor of love that he's talking about. Think about it in the church. These people are laying down their lives daily for each other. This group of people, don't know how big the church at Thessalonica was, but it wasn't very big. You may be looking at this group right here, as big as they were. It wasn't that big, you see? But the question is, I'm going to ask yourself again. Ask yourself again. Do you labor for your brothers and sisters inside this congregation? Like Paul is commending them for doing laboring in love like la I'm a bus mechanic I know what it means to labor and get on my back and work on stuff and my shoulders are hurting and the dust is flying in my eyes and I'm right and I go home at the end of the day and I am tired labor the question is, is are we failing at that where we are giving of ourselves laboring to say I love you yes I'm saying 
that's one of the joys that I've had this last year, is seeing a lot of people here. I'm showing the labor of love. It's been such an awesome experience. To see them loving God and laboring love and grace. That is what a congregation is. Work of faith. Our belief is first, right? Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what brings us together. That's our identity. And then we labor and we love each other. We, we're laboring for each other. We are loving each other. We're sacrificing ourselves for each other. Laying down our lives daily for each other. You see? What's the second commandment? Love others. Like you love yourself, love your right? Neighbors, like love yourself. your neighbor like yourself. Yes. So, and the next one, patience of hope. Romans, you know, he wrote Romans after he wrote Thessalonians. All right? I just want y'all to know that. What he was communicating in Thessalonians, he communicated in Romans. Yes. Because she gave all that she had. Right. That's good. That is good. So, the next one is patience and hope. Now, Thessalonians was written before Romans. But he starts, when he starts writing Romans, he starts bringing the same ideas out. And I want you all to listen to this. You can tell that the Thessalonians were suffering by what he says in Romans. They were suffering persecution. This is what he says in Romans 5.3. He says... And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience. You see? So in Thessalonians, he says, patience in the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. If tribulation brings patience, then we know that the Thessalonians were being persecuted because that's what brings patience. You see that? Tribulation. Sir, you had something? Yeah, you said three minutes. Yeah, sorry. I noticed that a while ago. And I want to read one more. What he says about it. In Romans 8. He says, again, the ideas that he was, obviously that he told them, again, you've got to think, you got to think about what Paul's saying. You you got to piece things together, because he's telling this to the Thessalonians, but he doesn't write it in the letter. He just says patience and hope. Right? He explains it in other letters. So he says, "For we are saved by hope." <laughs> so not only is he does he communicate in Romans what where patience comes from through tribulation, but he's telling you now what he's telling what he told the Thessalonians. He says. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. That's right. For what a man sees, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, yes. then we do with patience wait for it. <laughs> Same idea he was expressing to them. And he commended them for their patience and hope for our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4. Knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. It's not up there. Because it's very simple. He's letting them know. I know that I know that I know that you are beloved and that you are elect of God because of these things. Verse 5. 
And here's where it gets really, really good. And the reason it gets good, and I'll explain it in a minute, is because Paul believes what he's saying so much. He believes what he's saying. And he's expressing in this letter. He says, for our gospel came not unto you in word only. Why does he say our gospel? And not the gospel of God or the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. To the congregation that was in, uh, in his presence? I mean, is it in what you're saying? But he's, he's writing from his perspective, okay. writing out, saying, We came to you with our gospel, me, Timothy, and Silas. I preach it to you. And preach it to you. Oh. Not, a, not only in word, but I'm going to stop there. Yes. So why does he say our gospel? Who thinks they know? Oh. But I did. I think about it. Yes. Because they claimed it. Exactly. What's that? They he claimed it. Oh, okay. So I wrote military orders up here. My wife can attest to this. Whoever else has been in the military, Tim, anybody else? Thank you. Russ. Ma'am? Russ? Yep. Okay. So I was a platoon sergeant my last three years. And if you've been in the military, you know what that is. Dealt with a lot of stuff, but I would get orders from higher ups, and they would say, make sure the troops do this, right? What would I do? Would I go to the troops and say, the staff sergeant says we need to do this? Or would I say, this is what we're gonna do? You see that? Mm -hmm. That's the difference, right? What did I do? I took ownership and I took command of the order. This is exactly what he's doing. Does the Apostle Paul know that the Lord Jesus Christ, that the gospel is about him? Yes. But he takes ownership of the gospel. And he says, we came to you with our gospel. You see? He takes ownership of it. He doesn't, although he could say the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, it just shows that he claims it, right? He claims it. He takes ownership of it. He grabs it and he says, this is what I believe and this is what I'm pushing to you. That's what Earnest. Understood. Right. Well, I mean, I think that all of us should be the same way. We should have such a belief and such a, a desire, right, that the gospel should be something that we, we say, look, we are here to tell, we're here to preach this to you because we believe it so much. You see, that's, that's what they were doing right there. And he says, not only in word, remember, our living testimony. Yes. Right. I was uh, going to add that in uh, the Gospel of John, the first chapter, uh, verse 12 says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So, yes. like, by when we're saved, we become sons of God. Right. And the gospel becomes ours. Very good. Very good. That's good. That's, and that's, that's pretty deep. That can be unpacked, but that is good. That's very good. So he comes, they come in, not only in word, not only a word, but they come with power. Bill, when we first started in the room over there, he was talking about power, right? He was talking about the power of man and the power of angels, the power of God. And he's breaking them down how, how the power. But what is power? What is power? If they say, we came to you with not only word, but with power. What's he talking about? It's easy to, and I'm not taking any, away from anything that you were saying, because it's all correct, it's all true. But break down power. What did he mean when he said, we came in power? In the truth, I guess. From everything you would, that Christ would preach would be the truth, and would be in the power of, of Christ that you're preaching it. Okay. So. The power of Christ. Yes. What is the power of Christ? The gospel. Okay. <laughs> Listen to this. We believe it and we're firm in our structure. Say that again. We believe what we're told and we're firm in our structure and the way we present it. Okay, that's a good answer. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, people will often talk about the power of the gospel. Okay. Uh, and how the gospel has not lost its power. Uh, I think power is. Uh, in that sense, the ability to influence. Okay. So, like the ability to 
influence people is what gives you, you know, like is what power is. If someone's a powerful person, they have the ability to influence a lot of people. Very good. Okay. That's a good answer. And not to be able to change the mind of that individual with preaching it possibly. Like persuade. Right. Right? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. No, we can't do that without the Holy Spirit. Right? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's right. So, I want you all to watch this. The word power in the New Testament is dynamis. Tell me what English word that sounds like. Dynamite. Dynamite. I'm not talking about the show. Dynamite. I'm talking about the bomb. Right? The TNT. Power. If you've ever seen dynamite, again, when we was in Iraq, we used to collect all the weapons from, from the Iraqis and we put them in this big bunker. We call them caches, weapon caches. And we'd stand off to the side and they'd put C4 all over them and they'd say, let's watch it. We'd all be around the corner like this, kneeling down and watch these things, boom, just go up. All over the place. Power. It was shaking the ground. You see? So I want you to think about it like that. As they come into town, the power of God is on these men. Ground shaking power. And I want you, I want to read this. This came from this comes from Thayer's lexicon. Watch this. It's inherent power. Power exerted unto your souls by performing miracles. That's one way that they show power, right? By performing miracles. The power that the resurrection of Christ has for instructing, reforming, and elevating the soul. That's exactly what was going on. That message, that gospel message, is, is proof. He tells you right there, as they come in with power... You see the change in the Thessalonians as we continue on. You're going to see that they turn from idols. Well, how do they turn from idols? The power of the gospel. There's a power in preaching the resurrection of Christ that instructs and reforms and elevates and tran tranquils the soul. You see, that's what happens. And But the thing is, it's for some reason... The gospel's not being preached like that today. People are not, and I'm not going to say everywhere, because if you go online, there's a gypsy community of little kids who got the Holy Spirit all over them. There's a bunch of them. You can, I mean, you can watch these videos, but let me say America. You know, Pastor Lawson, Charles Lawson, he talks about a revival. All right, everybody talk, Bill, you talk about a revival, preachers talk about revivals, a lot of people talk about revivals. How does a revival happen? Right? How does a revival happen? A revival starts in a person. There's a revival that happens in a person, right? And the person comes in there and the power of God is all over them. And what happens? It spreads. That power, you see? And it starts going. And what happens? Uh, the community it ha starts happening to the community but it starts with one person yeah. does it not yeah. it started with Paul and Timothy and Silas as they walked in town the Thessalonians all these people worshiping idols and because they had the power of God not in word only but power being able to do miracles and that power that the resurrection of Christ and the message brings changed them yes it's they have power our culture here and the culture in other, other societies. Because, for instance, in Spain or, for instance, in, in Africa, it's a guy so tight knit of family's nucleus that when Christ gets a hold of one person in that family, everybody knows there's, there's, pop, there's a change, a radical change. Right. Where in America, we don't have that tight family nucleus. Right. So, therefore, the power comes in different. But but you, sometimes you can notice the power more based on the new based on what I mean just you can just notice it. Well, you see that, and especially with the Muslim community, when someone comes to Christ, it's radical. I mean, they don't care if they die or not. It's right. Just radical power. Right. And you see that in ep in episodes like Cornelius, right? 
Peter preaches to them, and the whole house, you see, the whole house gets saved. It was Cornelius that got the vision from the angel of God, right? And he says, send him because he's praying. And then when he gets into the house and starts preaching, the power, boom. And it covers them all, and they all start speaking in tongues. <laughs> you see that? That's what happened in Thessal Thessalonica. That's what happened with every town they walked in, Corinth and everywhere. This, this almost, as it, and I, Paul is not the originator of this power. I'm just letting you know that. He's not... Uh, he is not the origin of the power. It's God, right. the Lord Jesus, yeah. right? The Holy Spirit. But as he's walking into town, you tell me that what John R. W. Scott is talking about in his message, that those people didn't see that on him. What is it about this guy? There is something about him. Yeah. You see? Yeah. So, I'll ask you this. Ask yourself, when you walk into a room, do people look at you different because they know you're different? You see that? Do you have the power of God where when you speak and when you are communicating the gospel to people that that is changing people radically? Because it's not you. It's the gospel. See? So next, next verse. But also in power and in the Holy Ghost. Right? She says, well, that wouldn't happen. He doesn't have power without the Holy Ghost. That's right. The interesting thing about Paul, and as you watch his life and the letters and his persecution and his jailing and all that stuff, it seems like at first... I mean, it's just immense. The Holy Spirit is on him. Boom. Right? And he's just, all these things are happening and snakes are biting him and he's just shaking them off and nothing's happening. And, right? And he's healing people and all this stuff is happening. But over time, it starts kind of fading. It kind of starts, seems like the Holy Spirit's just kind of backing off a little bit. But Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he was able to do those things that he was doing. The Lord Jesus, when the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove, right? And Paul says, God told me that the one that gets covered with the Holy Spirit is the one I should be looking for. When he was on this earth, he was filled with the Holy Spirit at all times. We get it in measure. We get the Holy Spirit. He, he dwells in us, but... The power of the Holy Spirit comes in measure for us. With Paul, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit. You see? Yeah. And it's amazing. It's amazing what happens to people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Every single time. They get beat. Or they get thrown in jail. Because they're saying something powerful. You see? Yeah. That's what happens. Yes? Uh, that I would... And he's speaking of things like, who's ever heard that song, Lily in the Valley? Right? There's a lily in the valley, right? Well, he starts, talk, starts talking about there's gods in the valley. God is in the valley. There's peace in the valley. There's love in the valley. Those were in Christ, right? It's not when you're on the mountain that you gain any strength. It's when you're in the valley. You see? This is when you become... A godly man or a woman is when you're down here. And God is kind of like a child. You've got the bicycle and the training wheels and, you, and God's holding you like this and then kind of let you go and let you go and then you fall. Boom. But because we're in Christ, picks us up, puts us back on the bike and we continue to go.
But it's in those times of hurt. It's in those, that valley falling off that bicycle that you learn to get back up and ride the bicycle. You see? So. Also in power in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. They came with confidence. I know in whom I have believed and am confident in him that he's able to hold that. Right? That's what he says. They came with assurance. And as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. We'll get into that later. And you became followers. Here we go again. Of us. He says you became followers of us. He takes ownership. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Of what they're doing. And of the Lord. Having received the word in much affliction. They were being persecuted. They were being chased. They were being cursed. All these things were happening. But they received it with joy of the Holy, the Holy Ghost. And this will be the last thing here. The fact that they received the word is one thing. Jesus says that the seed goes out. Falls on stony ground. Falls on thorny ground. Falls on good ground. Right? There's a cut. And then he explains that it's either the devil and the, the demons are coming by and taking up the word and you don't even get to hear it. Or you get to hear it and they take it from you and your drinking buddies come along and say, come on, let's go drink. And then you just go along with them and the word doesn't matter. Or the thorns grow up and the, the world chokes it out, right? Your own things that you're doing, you're busy and all this stuff, it chokes the word out and you forget about it. But then there's good ground. The fact that they, Paul says that you receive the word means that that seed fell on good ground. That's exactly what that means. Yeah. Yeah. And they received the word in much afflictions with joy in the Holy Spirit. Who knows who Andrew Murray is? Have heard that name? Andrew Murray says, The Holy Ghost secures to me without interruption the presence and love of Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2 says that for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. I, I haven't heard that verse that much. That because Jesus is filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit, he endures the cross. Has anybody ever heard that? That's an interesting verse. Because he likens that same joy in the Holy Spirit to the Thessalonians. That Jesus joy of the Holy Spirit that he had, willing to endure the cross, he likens it to what they're doing. That joy, that same joy. So ask yourself again, is the joy that we have in this congregation of the Holy Ghost so much so that it's the same as Christ enduring the cross? Very interesting. You know, I think it was by Christ going to the cross, even though he knew he was being crucified, the joys that was going to be beyond that because he actually took over and, and conquered death right. so we could all have eternal life. Right. So that's the joys that, you know, he could know and see and, and the faith in his Father right. was going to give. And as we continue on, we'll end for tonight, but as we continue on, you'll see... The reason for the joy. You'll see that. The persecution that they were receiving. Was. There was questions. Paul wasn't there for that long. There was. You know. It's like. Bill Rose coming from Spain. And preaching to you. And teaching you. Nobody's heard nothing. Nobody's heard the gospel. He's here for three weeks. And he's gone. He gets kicked out. And so everybody's left wondering. We love the Lord. We, we, love, we, we know we're saved, but what about this? And what about that? And that's what we're going to learn as we continue on, that this is what was going on. Yes. I think it's awesome that you finish that up because I was thinking about the school room. We talk about confidence. We were talking about confidence. And if a teacher asks, who knows the question, you can see everybody got it. <laughs> right. And nobody knows, but if one person really knows the answer, Poof, right. I've got the confidence. I know. And that's kind of where Paul's going with this. People are searching and trying to find out what's going on. All of a sudden, 
I find the answer in Jesus Christ, and I, I got it. Yep. That's right. <laughs> the power of God. That's right. I got it. You know, everybody's like, I don't know. <laughs> I got it. That's right. Very good. Very good. So are there any questions about what we went over tonight? I know we started off with talking about some basic principles. And now what I want you to do is when we leave here, I want you to think about the first six verses. We didn't even get It's the first six verses. And look how much uh, application yeah. can be. You see that can be pulled out from these six verses and go, well, am I anything like this? Are we anything like this? Is my family anything like this? You see, because if you can't say that, then you got to wonder because do you think that the Thessalonians were seeking God with all their heart? They were. Did they have fear of the Lord? Yes, they did. Well, they had humility and love and sacrifice. Yes, they did. And they were a living testimony. You're going to see in the very next verse when we get to it. You can read it yourself when you get home. That the gospel from Thessalonica was sounded all through Greece. So imagine, I mean, all through Greece. Macedonia and Achaia. That's all of Greece. Imagine Paul's walking around Corinth, right? And then he hears somebody whispering going, this and the likings, boy. Do you hear about them? Do you hear about what's going on up there? The Holy Spirit and all this? And Paul's hearing this, right? As he's walking down the street. Imagine that. Because he's the one that started that church. So imagine his emotion when he starts writing this letter and he starts going, Oh, man. I hear about you guys down here. You guys are awesome. Right? And he's, and he's exhorting them and telling them how great they are. And then as, at the end of it, we'll see that he starts answering some questions. Yes? Um, you know, those that And I want to make a comment to that and tell you guys that it is an absolute privilege and an honor to even say one word out of this book to any of you. So I just want to say that, and it is absolutely God. Because I get up here fumbling when I'm doing this stuff, and as we start discussing things, yeah. God works it out. Yeah. And we need to pray for you. Absolutely. Thank you. Are there any questions? This living Bible, just a few verses. This is just scratching the surface of how deep it can it is. go. And Absolutely. Another time it might be a whole different message. Absolutely. And then I don't know if you should have any favorites, but I love Paul in the <clears> Bible. And he started out slaying the Christians, and God gave him the power to do what he did. And then he was so humble in the end, he said he was probably the worst. Run right. He was just wasn't worthy of what he did. Right. Wasn't that beautiful? Humility. Yeah. Immense humility. And that is what you get when you follow God. That's what that's that is a fruit of the spirit. Yeah. Humility and love, patience, you see, these kind of things. So do your own study. Again, I want to remind everybody again. Don't believe what I say. Go home. And if I'm wrong, I will repent and tell you that I'm wrong right in front of everybody. I just want to make that clear. But are there any questions? So like you were saying before, you should pray for the people they put in your path. And you and Bill or two of the people I've just come to praise and praise the Lord for you. Yes, sir. God bless you guys. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, just that I really like the, uh, the, the philosophical about uh, in Christ and uh, as a comment that that's how you know when it's super.
Right. Continue the regeneration of Jesus Christ. And we studious and consistent in it. It just has to be supernatural. Agreed. I don't think our flesh would allow us to do that. I really don't. Yes, sir. And I'm going to say this. I hope that while I'm in Spain, I'll be hearing the same thing that as Paul was hearing about this one. Like, hearing about it. People here, tell them church. Too. This is not, li listen, I want to end on this. This Bible is not something just that we just read. It's real. It's real. The, these words in here are inspired by the Holy Ghost. And so when we're reading them, we're learning from them, we are applying them. We take these things that we learn and we apply them to this church. You see, we apply them. And when he's in Spain, he writes a letter saying, yeah, you guys, you know, right. That's the way it works. And that's what Paul was doing. But Christ centeredness was the thought of the Thessalonians. And it's the thought of Paul. And it's the thought of Timothy. And it's the thought of Peter. And it's the thought of all of them. Christ is the center, not us. And if we put him center and we take these as real and we take these and we apply what it says that will be the true body of Christ following the Lord the way we're supposed to let us pray our Lord I pray this evening that your name be glorified amongst these people I thank you Lord for all the things that you have given us you bestowed blessings upon us, and that's what grace is. It's unmerited favor. For some reason, you're able to detect us, and you're able to look down on us. Our, how small and minute we are, you still look at us and love us, and you have redeemed us. I pray, Lord God, over all these people in here, that you would open their heart and open their mind, and allow us to escape from the noise and from the busyness and from the excuses and allow us to have time to just get in your word and ponder and meditate on what you're saying. I know that the prophet Elijah thought that you were coming in fire and earthquake and all these big things, but you came to him in a still small voice. How in the world are we supposed to hear you? Satan knows this. He knows it well. That we will not be able to hear you with all the distraction. So I pray that you help us. You take all these things away and let us get along with you in our closets or wherever, the, wherever it is. We may read your word and apply the things that you're, you've given us in these letters. I thank you, Lord, for the Apostle Paul and what you did in his life. And the instruction that you've given him to give to us. Lord, I pray that you would not let your word return to you void. Your word says that. And that we would all know it as truth. And that we would be courageous and stand firm in a world that is trying to get rid of you. Yeah. I pray that you be glorified because you are worthy of all power and glory and might and honor. And when it's all said and done, you will still be on your throne and your word will still be eternal. And we will praise you for it. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Amen.